Hi, this is Professor Makimura. So we're now continuing uh, the history of the world in the early modern period. And today we're gonna talk about uh, China. So let me now share a screen. Early modern China, ooh, this is the end. <laughs> early modern China, the Ming and Qing dynasties. So here we go. So there's a period of, there's a problem of periodization. Uh, typically when we do uh, periods, uh, we generally tend to use uh, political markers because major political events are correlated with socioeconomic changes. So for you know, early modern Middle East, uh, I used uh, the fall of Con Constantinople. Uh, for India, I used, I used the start of the Mughal Empire as the start of the early modern period. And it fits well with you know, what's happening in the rest of the world so that you know the trade links the entire world you know after 1492. Um, it's happening around the same time period um, and in the case of Europe you know we're using Columbus 1492 which is not a political affair but if you look at Spain uh, 1492 January 1st is also the day in which uh, Spain unifies the Iberian Peninsula well I mean you know, kicks the Muslims out basically uh, defeats the Muslims so the political changes and socioeconomic changes typically tend to go together. But in the case of China, the Ming Dynasty starts in 1368. And it's like over 100 years before, you know, Columbus sails the ocean blue. So it's a bit early for the start of the early modern China. And the Qing Dynasty starts in 1644, which is again, like about 150 years after Columbus sails the ocean blue. So uh, the political markers of change in dynasty generally is uh, not helpful in trying to think about you know, early modern China. Uh, but uh, if you do look at the socioeconomic changes that are brought about by this link in global trade, uh, massive changes will happen to China starting in the 1500s. So I think it still works. So this is the reason why for this class, I continue to use you know, the 1500s as the marker between you know, everything before the modern period when humanity is linked through trade and the modern period when humanity is linked through trade after 1500 or so. Uh, so, you know, I just wanted to, uh, you know, repeat this bit because it's an uh, important bit. Um, in the case of Japan, you don't get this problem because for Japan, you can actually do either two dates. You can do uh, 1477 with the start of the War and States period, or you can do uh, uh, 1568 with the effective end of the Boring States period with Nobunaga and either one of those uh, political changes is pretty close to 1492. Uh, but you know, <laughs> 1368 and 1644 is a bit far as you know, political dates to use in this uh, periodization for early modern. So having said that, uh, because we're talking about Ming China, let me just talk briefly about the politics of Ming China uh, before we get to uh, 1500s. Uh, and you know the, the basis of uh, government policies and stuff like that. So Ming China is formed in 1368 after uh, the Mongols basically abandoned China. A popular uprising takes place all across Northern China. Uh, from what I understand, basically what happened is, well, I'm not sure if this is uh, really the fault of the dynasty per se, I suspect it is, but you know, uh, the Mongols didn't really take care of the dikes of the Yellow River, and then the dikes of the Yellow River broke, and then it flooded, you know, the North China Plain, and, you know, I would imagine millions of people went homeless, hundreds of thousands of people died. So, uh, not surprisingly, the dynasty did its utmost to rebuild the dikes of the Yellow River. So they hired all these people to do it, and then as soon as the dikes of the Yellow River were completed, they just let these people go, and now all these people suddenly are jobless. And all these jobless people living in a, a period when, you know, uh, you know, the aftermath of the flooding of the Yellow River, where, you know, jobs aren't plentiful, um, and things are still pretty bad, then become bandits and, you know, start, you know, organizing and they eventually become anti-government forces and rebellions break out all across China. Uh, they're joined also by other, you know, uh, elements in Chinese society that are unhappy with Mongol rule. And the Mongols basically say, <laughs> screw this. And they just pack up and leave and they go back to Mongolia. And China is, you know, left in the hands of the Chinese. So Emperor Hongwu, uh, who's in uh, Nanjing, which is down here, Nanjing meaning the southern capital. So 
and Nanjing is down here. So you see the cursor here, and Nanjing is down here. Uh, uh, sets him, uh, becomes the new emperor of China of the Ming dynasty starting in 1368. Um, and Honggu's basic idea is to not fight expansionist wars and to focus more inwardly on you know, stuff that needs to be done to fix all the problems that happen under Mongol rule. Uh, after he dies, Honggu's uh, not eldest son, but grandson, uh, Honggu's uh, eldest son's son, uh, takes over. Uh, but uh, Hongwu's younger son uh, basically says, why is my nephew taking over? He's still only a kid. I'm, you know, I was in charge of the north. Uh, uh, this is the prince of Yen. He was in near Beijing. And, and I was defending China against the barbarians, the, you know, the, the Mongols. I should be the new emperor. And so he launches a civil war and in 1402 he wins. So this guy is Emperor Yongle. Uh, so Emperor Yongle, unlike his father, actually has an expansionist goal, and this is when you know Emperor Yongle launches those exp expeditions to foreign areas to reconstitute China in the cast of the Mongol Empire as the the universal empire. So um, under Emperor Yongle, you know they conquer Manchuria and they conquer Vietnam. Uh, South of Vietnam is Champa. So back then, Vietnam only included this bit down here, the, the northern bit of modern day Vietnam. So, you know, he launches all these conquests. Um, and so after Yong Le dies, the question is do we want to follow our founding emperor, Hong Wu, or do we want to follow his son, Emperor Yong Le, the third emperor? Um, and the decision is made when uh, Emperor Ying Zhong, who wanted to be like Yong Le, launches expeditions against the Mongols and in 1449 is captured by the Mongols. <laughs> so after the, he's, after the emperor of China is captured by the Mongols, this is called the Tumu crisis in 1449, the Ming dynasty says, yep, we're not doing these expeditionary things. We're not doing this outward thing. We're gonna focus inside. And it is the Ming dynasty that begins to build the Great Wall of China. The Great Wall of China that people see today is the Ming Wall. It's a wall made out of brick. It's made in the Ming dynasty and it's made you know, after the Tumu crisis. So the map of Ming China actually should look more like this, right? So that's the Great Wall of China. And it's south of this that Ming Dynasty controls. And basically they abandon everything north of this. So although they abandon interference in uh, Mongolia and in Manchuria, that doesn't mean that they're not interested in them. Their goal is to make sure that, you know, the Mongols are in the the, the nomads of the north, the Mongols and the Manchus, don't unite to become a threat to the, to the Ming dynasty. So they periodically intervene and they prop up one candidate to be, uh, they, no, no, not one, they prop up multiple candidates to be rivals against each other to make sure that they never unified. Um, so uh, that's the Ming policy. Oh, and you know, uh, after Yong Le dies, uh, they pull out of Vietnam. So, you know, Ming Dynasty basically goes back to this. So this becomes really known, this really becomes known as China proper, right? And beyond these territories is really not considered China for a long time. So does that make China isolationist? Uh, I hear this a lot, that Chinese were isolationists, they built the big wall, the great wall of China, not big, the great wall of China, and they didn't care about the outside world, et cetera, et cetera. And all I can say to that is it's just BS. <laughs> China was never isolationist. Uh, if there was an East Asian country that was isolationist and did not allow foreigners inside their country, that is Japan. Japan was isolationist. <laughs> Japan was isolationist during much of the Edo period, but China was never isolationist. Uh, they're always willing to trade, except that they have to trade, you have to trade on Chinese terms, right? Uh, that's the key thing to uh, understand. Oh. And uh, it, even in the case of the Ming Dynasty, where it seemed pretty easy, they continued to expand. So uh, down here in the southwestern corner of China is modern day uh, Yunnan. And that area actually continues to be expanded under the Ming Dynasty because it was seen as easy pickings. Uh, this was the area where you know, the Burmese people and you know, other Southeast Asian peoples used to live. And the Chinese basically came and they took over this area. Uh, China's never isolationist. Key thing to understand, not isolationist. It's important, so I repeated it. <laughs> okay, 
So uh, what do we mean by like you have to trade on Chinese terms? Well, in the Ming Dynasty, they basically insisted that you had to become a tributary to be able to trade with China. So you have to join what is called the tribute trade system. Uh, so a tributary means that uh, you have to accept the status of the Chinese emperor as the supreme ruler of the known world, right? And that you are nothing but a barbarian king, that you are not the equal of the Chinese emperor. You have to, you have to accept a subservient status. Now, why do this? You do this because if you do, when you go visit the emperor on certain occasions, or when you go visit the imperial court on certain occasions, well, maybe not you directly, the, the barbarian king, but the, your representatives, um, when you give uh, tribute or you know, gifts to the Chinese court, uh, of, let's say, you know, something worth a million dollars because you are the king, uh, then the Chinese would re respond by giving back Chinese gifts that are worth five to 10 times more. So like five to $10 million worth of gifts. And this is to show you know, the bounty of the emperor of China. So they always give you more than, when, than what you give to them. So materially you benefit, right? So that's why if you're willing to swallow your pride, a lot of countries became tributary states. So then, why would the Chinese insist on this? The Chinese would insist on this because if you become a tributary state, the understanding is that you will not invade China. So instead of having a massive army to defend these huge, you know, these, these long borders that China has, get these countries to be tributaries and they won't invade China. So you don't need that army anymore. So compared to the cost of maintaining a massive army, the cost of you know, paying out some money in the tribute trade is perfectly fine, right? So that's the official trade that you conduct. And then when you actually do send your representative to China, uh, you can also you know, send merchants to, along with that uh, tributary mission so that the merchants of your country can then trade with the Chinese at certain locations uh, freely with the Chinese merchants at the, as regular private trade. Um, so this is why, you know, uh, the Chinese would insist on the tribute trade. It, it was basically a way to buy peace. And a lot of barbarian countries, quote unquote barbarian countries, a lot of foreign countries accepted this because it was materially beneficial. Uh, you know, as <laughs> the best story I happen to know is the story of the Koreans. Uh, the Koreans accepted this tributary status. And, <laughs> and at one point they said, uh, can we send a tributary mission every month? <laughs> <laughs> and the Chinese response was, no, 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 no. Every, every month is to 12 times a year is too much. You know, once on the new year, once on the birthday of the emperor, and one more time for some other guys, like three times is more than enough. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I mean, that, that shows you that this was a highly profitable venture from the perspective of the tributaries. Right? <clears throat> um, also, as tributary, you know, by association, the Ming dynasty, in theory, uh, has to, you know, uh, what's the right word? Uh, in theory, is obligated to protect the tributary state as the you know, suzerain. Um, this actually does happen in the case of Korea, but in other countries, generally speaking, it doesn't happen. So, you know, why is it that there's so many tributaries of up to like 60 countries? That's because under Emperor Yong Le, he organized what is called the, the uh, uh, the treasure fleet. So he got the uh, Chinese uh, eunuch uh, admiral by the name of Zhang He to go on these long journeys out of China to Southeast Asia, all the way across the Indian Ocean into uh, Middle East and to East Africa. And in one of these journeys, they brought back a giraffe. Uh, Zhang He himself was a Muslim. So, you know, he and some other Muslims uh, managed to do the, the Hajj. They did the uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, so uh, the 1400s, the early 1400s is really the Chinese age of discovery when the Chinese discovered the world around them. And you know, uh, even though the, the treasure fleets basically ceased to operate and you know, official missions from China basically stopped going to Southeast Asia and to the Indian Ocean, trade once open, basically private traders will now apply the seeds in vast numbers, much more than before. So it's pretty important. Um, 
Now, because you know the treasure fleets are really expensive, just imagine you know paying you know five times more, ten times more to sixty some odd countries. <laughs> uh, the dynasty eventually said, you know what, we don't really care about what happens in India, in the Indian Ocean, or you know like deep in Southeast Asia. So uh, we're not going to send the treasure fleet anymore. And if people stop coming to us. Just let it be. <laughs> if private traders want to come to us, we'll think about it, but we're not going to send official missions. And if they're not going to send official missions, it's all right. And so uh, if in you know, 1424, you know, by the time Emperor Yongle dies, you have this like huge 60 you know, tributary countries, by the time you get to 1500, <laughs> there's only six countries that are still doing the tribute trade. And by 1800, that goes down by another half and only three countries are involved in the tribute trade. And these last three countries that continue to do the tribute trade are the kingdoms of Ryukyu, Korea, and Vietnam. And that's it, all the other countries basically stop, right? So like, for example, Thailand at one point sent tributary missions, uh, the Burmese sent tributary missions, uh, the Japanese shoguns sent tributary missions, et cetera. But you know, all that comes to an end. Uh, all right. <clears throat> So if you don't do the tributary trade, then what happens? Well, uh, you are branded a pirate <laughs> because you're not officially sanctioned traders. So you're, you know, like the illegal traders at sea are called pirates. And because they're not operating outside the law, pirates, well, well, we're already pirates. So we're already outlaws. So we'll do whatever the heck we want to do. And so although they don't always like go out and kill people or anything like that, you know, they're basically traders, but they can become violent and there's really nothing to stop them. Uh, and, you know, although in the historical records, they're often called the wako, the quote unquote Japanese pirates, um, the actual people involved in the piracy is in the 1500s is actually Chinese. <laughs> the, the Chinese officials themselves actually write this down and say that, you know, among these quote unquote Japanese pirates, you know, something like 80%, 70% of the pirates are actually Chinese. And the Japanese only make up like 10% of the pirates and the rest are like the Koreans and some other people. <laughs> so the vast majority of the quote unquote pirates that you see in the 1500s are actually Chinese. And it's because uh, after the official trades that were done in 1424, people wanna do trade, but they can't, they're not allowed to do trade. So they become known as you know, outlaws and so become pirates, right? So <laughs> To pretend, so I mean, you actually get like these Chinese, you know, merchants who pretend that they're Japanese by wearing Japanese clothes and you know wearing Japanese hairstyle, but uh, they're actually Chinese. <laughs> so the obvious solution to end the piracy problem is to allow trade again, right? So if you're not gonna, if you're gonna like slowly make the official trade, you know, you know, die down because it's too expensive, then you have to allow private trade to flourish. And so starting in 1509, that is precisely what the Ming Dynasty starts to do. They first say, all right, Canton is now gonna be an open port for all foreigners. So, you know, if you're a foreigner and you wanna trade with us, come to Canton. Um, and basically uh, the Middle Easterners, eventually the Europeans, uh, the Indians uh, and Southeast Asians will begin to arrive in Canton to conduct trade with Chinese merchants. The Chinese merchants themselves will be organized eventually into these Hongs, which are essentially uh, trading guilds, and you only can trade with these guild members, right? <clears throat> okay, um, so the Portuguese uh, arrive in China <laughs> and because they don't have anything that the Chinese want, uh, you, know, like, you know, like the Portuguese coming to uh, India with uh, you know, fur <laughs> and wools, <laughs> well, wool, woolens, you know, it's like coming to Canton in Southern China with woolens is not gonna help you. So the Portuguese end up becoming, you know, pirates and they are also slave traders because that's what they learn what to do in Africa. So they do that over here as well. And this pisses off the Chinese to no end. So the Portuguese are actually banned from going to Canton. <laughs> the Portuguese are just kicked out of China. They come back begging to be allowed to be able to trade. And the Chinese say, you can't trade in Canton, but here's this malaria infested swamp called Macau and go there and the Portuguese end up in Macau. And so from 1557 to 1999, the Portuguese are in Macau. And if you give credit where credit is due, uh, Portuguese Macau over time becomes a very nice city. Now today it's one of the major you know, uh, tourist attractions in China today. Uh, 
Yeah, I said today twice, but you get the picture. <laughs> um, and in 1567, uh, not only are foreigners allowed to come to Canton, in 1567, Chinese merchants, once they get you know, licensed, they are now allowed to leave China with passports with the caveat that they should come back within the year. Right? And so with these two, with the allowance of foreign traders to come to China and with the allowance of Chinese traders to leave China, piracy comes to an end. And by 1600, piracy is gone. <laughs> uh, so that was the problem, right? Uh, oh, by the way, the Japanese pirates were called Japanese pirates because in the 1300s, like 1368 or so, uh, the pirates really were Japanese pirates. Um, and from the Japanese records, we know that what was, one of the things that was happening uh, is that uh, starting in the, uh, in the 1200s, Japanese pirates were running around in uh, East Asia because the Mongols, uh, you know, in their two invasions of Japan, actually kidnapped a lot of Japanese people and brought them back to the continent and to Korea. So, you know, the left the families that were left over basically uh, got on their boats to, you know, go seek their uh, loved ones, and they were also treated as pirates. So that's that's the origin thereof. And then, you know, once that starts, you know, it's kind of hard to stop, right? It's like you you learn the taste of piracy of uh, looting, and it's kind of hard to like, tell people to stop doing that. Um, okay, <clears throat> so uh, the trade. Uh, the Chinese traders and the foreign traders basically are going to be uh, coalescing around uh, five ports ultimately. Uh, these five ports are of course Canton, this is the first port uh, where foreigners are allowed to come. Uh, there's also the port of Amoy. Amoy is the port in which Chinese merchants go to Southeast Asia. Uh, there is the port of Fuzhou. Fuzhou is the port in which uh, traders from the Ryukyu Kingdom show up to China. So Chinese merchants uh, basically have a strong tie to uh, the Ryukyu Kingdom in Fuzhou. Uh, there is the port of Ningbo. This is the, the port city where the Chinese merchants who go to Japan depart from. Uh, for a while, Japanese merchants coming to China would uh, land in Ningbo. And especially after 1816, 1839, there is the port city of Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai ultimately will be the greatest trading port. Um, and by the 20th century, not only will it be the greatest trading port, it will be the largest city in China, right? uh, which I think is still the case, although the definition of city is kind of wonky in China. It's kind of weird. Uh, so like, I think there's one city where it's basically like the size of an entire province that they call itself a city. And so that's like the largest city in China, but that's not really a city by any normal definition. That's just the definition of a city by a minister's status. So it's kind of weird. Uh, <clears throat> Anyway, uh, you know, another proof of how China's not isolationist, Chinatowns. Uh, Chinatowns are all over the world, um, and the earliest Chinatowns are set up in Southeast Asia. And uh, if China really was isolationist, you wouldn't have Chinatowns. <laughs> right? I mean, why would there be Chinatowns if the country was isolationist? It makes no sense, right? Chinatowns exist because you have all these people from China who live in these Chinatowns that maintain contact with China back uh, with their adopted home and with their home in China. So that's why you have Chinatowns. Um, so, you know, another proof that China was not isolationist. Um, There's a uh, big push for people to actually leave China and go to Chinatowns in Southeast Asia in the uh, 1700s. Um, the Qing Dynasty will actually try to stop them, but that will fail. Uh, and then in the 1800s, there's another big push to people from China, uh, for people from China to leave. And in the 1800s, they go to uh, the West. Right? They go to the Americas, typically. All right. So Ming government, uh, let me uh, talk about that. Uh, the government structure that was created in the Ming Dynasty is ultimately going to be carried over into the Qing Dynasty. So very briefly, uh, the first emperor and the third emperors of the Ming Dynasty create what is called imperial autocracy. And the idea here is that you don't have a prime minister. So you have all these government offices. These government offices ultimately uh, can be uh, concentrated into six ministries, six ministries. So you have the Ministry of Personnel, Ministry of Taxes, Ministry of you know, the War or the Military, Ministry of Public Works, the Ministry of Justice, or to be more precise, the translation would be punishment, <laughs> and the Ministry of Rights. Uh, the Ministry of Rights is the one that conducts foreign policy. Uh, so you have these six ministries, and in the past, you also had the office of prime minister, 
would then talk to each of these six ministers and they would decide what to do. So for example, if you want to expand your military, well then uh, you need uh, three different ministers to agree, right? You need the minister of taxes to figure out where you're gonna get the money from, finances, sorry. Uh, you need to get the ministry of war to figure out, you know, where to station the army, you know, who, who to assign, uh, and how many soldiers to get, and you need the military personnel to figure out who should be the officers in this army, right? The top ranking officers, and low ranking officers can be selected by the generals, but the top ranking officers need to be selected by the government. So that's three ministries that need to work together. And so, you know, the prime minister would work with these three ministers to then figure out the plan. And then once the plan is made, the prime minister would then bring the plan to the emperor and the emperor would then say, all right, let's do this or all right, let's not do that. And then that will be that. Well, the first emperor thought that the prime minister, uh, that one of the prime ministers he had was plotting against him. <laughs> so he had him assassinated. Uh, well, not assassinated, he had him executed. And afterwards, that's it, no more prime ministers. So each of the six ministers directly report to the emperor. So only the emperor actually knows what's going on in the entire country. Each of the six ministers only know their narrow specialty, but that's it. They, don't, they actually don't know the grand picture. Only the emperor does. Um, so this really gives, puts all the power into the hands of the emperor. And so this is sometimes called imperial autocracy. Right? Whereas, you know, like in that previous case where I talked about the expansion of the military with the prime minister, you know, the prime minister and the three ministers generally get a sense of what's going on because you know the minister of the military is saying we need more soldiers here because we're being attacked by oh so this might actually include the foreign ministry right the ministry of rights so you get the picture right? so, I mean you you bring in all these people and they're like all right so we we need this much money and the minister uh, we need this many troops over here because of the foreign policy and the situation going on and then the ministry of Taxes will say, well, our tax income is like this because of what's going on. So we can't really, we can only give you this much. So, you know, like the ministers talk to each other and they get a sense of what's going on in the country as a whole uh, before, but now, no, only the emperor does. Now the first emperor was so paranoid that he actually like did all the paperwork himself, which is like really, really insane. Uh, the third emperor was not that insane. <laughs> But he inherited the imperial autocracy system and he kept it. So instead of he himself going through all the paperwork, um, he actually hired private secretaries, people who are not, you know, who are not selected through the government offices, uh, through the regular channels, but like, you know, people that he really trusts that he hired as private secretaries. And these private secretaries together then went through all the, you know, uh, paperwork that these six ministries uh, you know, sent to the emperor. And then, you know, the emperor is not going to read like all these documents. Like we have records of like within a span of like 10 days, something on the order of 1,700 letters were sent to the emperor. <laughs> so the emperor basically has to read all these letters and, you know, it's got like probably and, not every single letter has only got one thing. Like some letters probably contain like two or three things that they demand. So the emperor's like swamp was like 2,000 some odd things that he's got to decide and you know, thousands of letters. So, you know, 1,700 letters is some ridiculous amount. So you need private secretaries to handle that for you. <laughs> and that is the creation of the cabinet system. Uh, and this is the government system that's created by the Ming dynasty and inherited by the Qing dynasty, the, the, the dynasty that follows will basically, you know, follow the same pattern of, of this. Uh, the first emperor, uh, his focus was on making China, China again, getting rid of the Mongol influences as much as he could. So that meant uh, restoring Confucianism to its pride of place as the central ideology of the country and adopting the civil service exams uh, and using Confucianism as the uh, curriculum. So just like today, if you want to get a government job, you have to pass certain civil service exams, depending on the government job you're doing. Uh, Ming China invented the idea of these civil service exams. And unless you pass these civil service exams, you can't get a government job. Uh, and you know, the, these ranks, right? So you get the local civil service exams. Uh, so you get like the qualifying civil service exams, or you get the local civil service exams, and you get the prefectural civil service exams. Once you pass the prefectural civil service exams, then you can actually be a government official at the local level. And then once you pass that, uh, you can, uh, so, so even if you fail the next ones, you can become a local government official. 
And then above that is the metropolitan exams, which is held at the capital. So initially it's held at Nanjing. And then after the third emperor, it's held at Beijing because the third emperor moved the capital to Beijing. So this, the metropolitan exams are given at the capital. And then once you pass that, then you have what is called the imperial exams where the exam is ostensibly, you know, uh, made by the emperor and all the students take it. Basically everybody passes, it's just a formality. But the idea is that because as a student, you pass the civil service exams that's been created by the emperor, now you are the emperor student. And so not only is there a, you know, a government uh, official that, hi that you're a government official that's hired by the emperor, you're also now in a, a teacher-student relationship with the emperor. So it's supposed to like increase the bonds between the emperor and the government of officers. So that's the point of the civil service exams. And because all the questions are about Confucianism, Confucianism becomes the state ideology one more, once more. Okay? Uh, the Ming Dynasty issues the Ming Code. Uh, this is the law code that's used by the Ming Dynasty and then will be carried on, inherited by the Qing Dynasty as well. Um, and in this, by creating uh, this, recreating the civil service exams, uh, the dynasty uh, breathes new life into what is called the gentry. So the gentry are a semi-hereditary people. Uh, so let me try to explain this. <laughs> it's always rough. So uh, if you pass the civil service exams, you become a government official. Everybody who becomes a government official is a part of the gentry. So, you know, and the lowest job you can get as a gentry is as a magistrate. You can become a county magistrate. So, you know, you have the nation, then you have the provinces, the states, and then underneath them you have the counties. So, the lowest job you can get if once you pass the metropolitan exam is a county magistrate. <clears throat> And a county magistrate is a very powerful position. It's a position in which you're not only the mayor or the, the county leader, but you're also the police chief and you're also the judge. <laughs> it's like all the powers are in you. All the powers of, of government is vested in you. You're, you're, you can essentially be a little tiny dictator of the county. Like nobody can stop you on this, right? Um, and you can be highly corrupt if you want to. And a lot of people were very corrupt. Um, it is said that you know, even a official that's known to be relatively clean, even a pure official who doesn't accept that many bribes will still amass enough fortune so that for three generations, they will be wealthy. That family will be wealthy. So everybody who's ambitious in China <laughs> tries to pass the civil service exams and become a government official. Only about 300 people will pass every three years. There aren't that many people who pass the metropolitan exams. Only about 300 people every three years. But everybody tries. <laughs> everybody who's ambitious tries because you get to be very, very wealthy if you wish to be, if you wish to do so. Uh, so what this means is that this creates a semi-hereditary class. So to be gentry, you have to pass the civil service exams. I mean, to be a government official, you have to pass the civil service. Well, what if I have passed the civil service exams and you know, I'm now a government official. Uh, I'm not particularly, you know, greedy, so I'm not particularly amassing wealth, but I have enough money to like, you know, lead a rich life. Um, I want my son to actually like follow in my footsteps, but my son's stupid. <laughs> he can read and write, but there's no way he's gonna pass the Metropolitan Civil Service exams where only three people pass every three years. Not, not gonna happen. Well, I have money. So what I can do is if my son's stupid, I can make sure that my grandson will pass the civil service exam. I can make sure to hire the best tutors. I can make sure to get a small library for my son, to get all the books necessary for my grandson, not my grandson. And so uh, although they're technically not hereditary class, it becomes a semi-hereditary class where once you become gentry, it becomes very easy for the children and grandchildren of gentry to become gentry. And by the end of the Ming Dynasty, we have records of you know, uh, government officials and people you know, of a census record. And one of the questions is, you know, was your father or grandfather a government official? And about half the people say yes. So who are the other half? In the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, the other half were probably people who were independent wealthy in the countryside, rich landlords, because land was the basis of wealth back then, right? 
Um, and this was actually important because if you are a, a landlord, if you live in the countryside, then you know something about agriculture. And in a country that's like 90% farmers, <laughs> China's 90% farmers all the way until the 20th century. You know, and uh, up until 2000, 70% of the population in China lived in the rural countryside. Pretty amazing number. Like only 30% of the people in China lived in the big cities. Um, you know, in 2000. Um, so, you know, uh, if the overwhelming number of people in China are farmers, then government job, firstly and most importantly, is about making sure that agriculture runs smoothly. So when there is a storm, what do you do? When there is like a typhoon coming, what do you do? Uh, when there is a flood, what do you do? When there is, you know, locusts, what do you do? Uh, if you live in the countryside, you know, because you have dealt with this yourself and you know what the government's response ought to be. So when you pass the civil service exams, even though the civil service exams are all about Confucianism, you know the actual things you need to do as a government official. And so the Ming government kind of runs smoothly. In the second half of the Ming dynasty, after the 1500s, increasingly you get officials whose parentage is the merchant class. So commerce becomes bigger and bigger starting in the 1500s. And you get a lot of these like merchants that are very wealthy. And if you're a very wealthy, very wealthy merchant, a civil service exam, you know, as long as you get an education for your children or grandkids, they pass. So, well, you don't have to be a landlord to pass. And so merchant kids begin to pass. And these merchant kids obviously live in cities. They don't know anything about agriculture. So when half the population of these government officials are former government officials, so, so they know about government, but they don't really know what agricultural life is like. And a significant portion is now also merchants who know about city life, but don't know anything about agricultural life. And the relatively few are now children of landlords and know anything about agriculture. Now you've got a major skew problem of who knows how to run agriculture? Who knows what the government job is in relation to agriculture? Fewer and fewer people. And because you get fewer and pe fewer people who know about agriculture that's running the show, uh, the government response to you know, agricultural crises get worse and worse, and that eventually is going to lead to more and more rebellions over time. So uh, this is the nature of Chinese style government, right? Civil service exams, uh, imperial autocracy, uh, Confucianism at the core, and a semi-hereditary governing class called the gentry, who uh, in the past worked reasonably well because, you know, the majority of them were, well, 50% you know, of them were children of landlords. Okay, um, Ming government vis-a-vis uh, -vis the North. Uh, traditionally, uh, the Chinese governments were afraid of the North. Uh, the North was where the danger came from. So after you build the Great Wall, there's an active policy to make sure that the Northern uh, nomads are constantly at odds with each other. I talked about that. Um, and by extension then, the other borders of China are kind of neglected. They don't really like, care that much about it because they don't think they can, that can be a threat. So the South is not really considered to be a threat. Right? The Southern part of China, they, they don't see threats coming from there. Uh, and this will also be carried over into the Qing Dynasty. And when the British come from the South, because they're sailing from, the, from India, from the Indian Ocean, and then up the you know, South China Sea, uh, they don't really see it as a threat because traditionally the threat always came from the North, uh, which means when the Russians begin to arrive, the Manchus, the Qing dynasty, do react and they take decisive action to try to deal with the Russians that are coming in because they've always felt that from the danger comes from the north. And the Russians were the you know, a major threat. Um, so there you go. Right? I mean, piracy is a problem, but it's not going to like you know overthrow the country, whereas <laughs> the Mongols did overthrow the country, um, and. Uh, the Manchus will also overthrow the country. All right, uh, so after 1500, after global trade really takes off, what happens? One of the things that happened that's really important is a population boom. So American crops, uh, crops native to the Americas. So corn seed and potatoes come to China. And then from that seed, people in China grow corn. And from that potato, they begin to grow more and more potato. So with corn and potato, lands that were previously left untouched because they thought that it was you know, like unusable for agriculture, or rice agriculture to be more precise, or wheat agriculture, you go, well, 
we can grow corn here, we can grow potato here. And food is grown all across China. And so you get a massive population uh, boom. Don't need that. Um, so that's one. Um, at, you know, so by massive population, I have it somewhere later, but you know, the population of China goes from like 60 million in 1368 to like 100 million uh, and then 150 million <laughs> and then like 300 million. It just grows and grows and grows. It's just it's nothing to check it. Uh, the maximum population China had uh, before uh, the Ming Dynasty was around 100 million people during the uh, Sung Dynasty. And that was the maximum population that China had. Uh, before that, 60 million was, you know, the, 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 like the good number for a Chinese dynasty. The Han dynasty, the Tang dynasty, early Ming dynasty, they were all around 60 million, 60 million people. So population boom, this is, well, this is actually pretty important. Uh, another major impact is that from 1500s, there's going to be a massive flow of silver into China. Uh, the flow of silver is coming from the Europeans because of you know, the Spanish colonies in New Spain and in Peru. Um, and then also, you know, Japan actually begins to have a huge silver mine. Uh, so silver flows to China and China and outflows, you know, things like silk, porcelain, and later tea. But, you know, you can keep making more silk year after year. You can keep making tea year after year. And porcelain is made from ultimately from dirt. So, <laughs> you know, like all this silver flowing in makes China immensely wealthy and China becomes fully commercialized. So when China becomes fully commercialized, uh, you have what is called the single whip tax. Right? The single whip tax is gonna be fully implemented by the 1570s. And what that means is all the various taxes that exist in China will be converted to its silver equivalents. And as a Chinese citizen, your job is to pay your taxes once a year in this single whip tax. You pay it in a lump sum of silver. Which means every person in China down to the lowliest peasant has access to silver. Um, so this is what I mean by Chinese economy has become fully commercialized. Um, now, you know, before the advent of, you know, full commercialization through silver, so in 1368, like the first emperor of China, uh, not, the first emperor of Ming Dynasty China, Emperor Hongwu, he realized that, you know, well, we don't have enough gold mines, we don't have enough silver mines, and we don't have enough copper mines. What do we do? Well, let's do what the Mongols, and let's do what the Sun Dynasty, let's use paper money. <laughs> Well, by this point in time, people in China don't trust paper money anymore because there was hyperinflation at the end of the Sung Dynasty and there was hyperinflation at the end of the Mongols. So it's like Mongol Yuan Dynasty. So, so people don't take the paper currency seriously and very quickly within Hongu's reign, you get hyperinflation. <laughs> and so the people of China, believe it or not, actually go back to bartering. They go back to a barter economy uh, during Hongwu and, you know, probably up, up through like, you know, Young Le's reign and, and thereafter. And it's only after, you know, this huge inflow of silver that the Chinese economy begins to use money once again. Which is kind of scary. <laughs> that a society that advanced basically can you know, backslide. Um, and with this, you know, with this commercialization, that means merchants are going to be very wealthy and merchants can send their children to become members of the gentry, which I talked about earlier. And not only that, when the merchants become wealthy, they form guilds. Well, even before they become wealthy, the merchants had formed guilds. And when these merchants form guilds, these guilds then pool the resources of these merchants and they begin to actually run the local community. So Chinese cities had you know, firefighting brigades and stuff like that, but these brigades were not paid by the government. The Chinese government didn't run these, you know, firefighters. Chinese governments did not run orphanages. Chinese governments did not run schools, but the local guilds ran these things, right? So cities uh, will be, you know, uh, city services will actually be done by the private sector in China uh, through the guilds. So, uh, you know, ch Chinese cities, uh, you know, were already fun places starting in the Sung Dynasty, but, uh, now you get a much stronger influence of the guilds starting with the Ming Dynasty. And this will continue all the way through to the Qing Dynasty. So generally speaking, where the private sector can do it, the government allows the private sector to handle the situation. 
it's only in the far flung reaches of the edges of the empire when there's not enough mercantile activity that the government is going to step in and run you know firefighters or you know um, uh, you know schools or orphanages or things like that those will be run by you know the, the local guilds rice guild you know buying and selling rice silver guild you know uh, in, you know, that's responsible for making sure that the uh, silver is pure and you know stuff like that you know these uh, people who, who can actually they don't taste the silver but they look at the silver and they they clink at it and hear the sound and go all right this is this percentage silver uh <clears throat> pure silver um and uh we have you know stories from the early 20th century when some of these people were still alive and Apparently they 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 pretty much were right on the dot, <laughs> uh, even when compared to scientific methods to, to uh, figure out the purity of silver. So um, the silver guild, by the way, is the name that will eventually be used to describe the word bank. <laughs> All right. So China transforms tremendously under uh, the Ming Dynasty through uh, you know the, the, the trade. Okay, so now let's talk about the Ming-Qing transition from 1616 to 1683. Uh, so I, I have here corruption at Ming's court. Uh, so 1644 is when the Ming dynasty collapses, but let me talk about it uh, from 1616 onwards. Um, and you can probably even make the argument it goes back to like uh, 1592, but anyway. So first up is corruption at Ming court. Um, to be honest, the corruption of Ming, Torp, Ming court probably started pretty much from the beginning of the dynasty. <laughs> All right, maybe not the beginning, beginning, but from very early periods. Um, and this is because, you know, the emperor uh, is raised in the imperial palace. Uh, there are no men in the imperial palace. There's only uh, the emperor, his children, no adult sons, uh, his women, and eunuchs to take care of his women. <laughs> so because he knows no male figures, <laughs> And he's kind of raised by women and eunuchs. The, he, the people he tends to trust, you know, the emperors, the, the people who the emperors tend to trust tend to be eunuchs. Um, and these eunuchs have, you know, they can't have children, but, uh, you know, so they don't have a sex drive, but they do love money. <laughs> and, you know, corrupt eunuchs can be very, very corrupt. Like there's one eunuch in the Ming Dynasty who uh, amassed a private fortune of roughly uh, equivalent to uh, 10 times the uh, national budget. <laughs> um, so corruption was actually nothing new. Uh, there was always corruption, um, I think. Uh, so what really changed? Um, and I think what really changed is the reaction of the gentry and how to run the government. Uh, and that's because the character of the gentry class began to change. Instead of being half landlords, we increasingly became more and more merchant class and with fewer and fewer former landlords or from the landlord class becoming gentry, uh, the Ming government was less and less responsive to crises. So here are some of the crises that happens. Uh, one is a war inside Korea against Japan. So Japan gets unified in 1591 and then after its unification, Hideyoshi launches an invasion to conquer China and India. This is his ostensible goal. And the first step is Korea. Uh, well, he asked the Koreans so that the Japanese troops could actually just march through Korea and the Koreans say no. So the war goes up, starts against Korea first. Uh, this leads to a six year long war inside Korea against Japan. Um, and of course, taxes need to rise because <laughs> you're fighting a war. People are not happy about that. As soon as that war is over, um, you know, you know, or as that war is happening, uh, Ming control over the Manchus begin to slip. And after the Ming control is lost, the Manchus have basically begun to organize and finally begin to unify. And when the Manchus have finally begun to unify, now you know, they, they, for, they call themselves the later Jin um, and fight a war against the Ming dynasty. So there's now a war against the Manchus. And again, taxes have to rise and the people aren't happy about that. So taxes are rising because you're fighting these foreign wars. In the midst of this tax rising, you have a series of agricultural, uh, you have a series of crop failures, agricultural crises, right? Uh, so famines begin to break out. And when famines begin to pay out, you know, people don't have enough food, they don't have enough money to pay taxes. Surprise, surprise, peasant rebellions. 
um, and a guy called Li Zi Cheng is the key leader of this peasant rebellion. And eventually, Li Zi Cheng's army is going to march into Beijing when the main Ming army is fighting against the Manchus at the Great Wall or north of the Great Wall. So the last Ming emperor commits suicide in Beijing in 1644 because of an internal rebellion. When that happens, the general guarding the gates of the Great Wall basically asks the Manchus to stop fighting a war against him and to work with him to avenge the death of the Ming Emperor. And so a Manchu army marches into China because the Chinese general opens the gate to the Great Wall. And when the Manchu army marches in, they sweep into Beijing and they kick Li Zicheng out of Beijing and eventually the Manchus will kill Li Zicheng. When that happens, you know, when the Manchus take over Beijing to you know, avenge the death of the Ming Emperor, the Manchus claim that they are the rightful heirs to the throne. And so the Manchus claim to be the new rulers of China as the Qing Dynasty. Now, relatives of the Ming Emperor are not happy about this. And so they rise in rebellion or they say, you know, the Ming is not dead yet. We will continue uh, our dynasty. And they prop themselves up in Southern China uh, and they will fight a war against the Manchus uh, all the way until the 1680s. And the last bit that happens uh, is that, oh, and so how do the Manchus win against them? The Manchus basically hire Chinese generals to fight against other Chinese. So the Manchus are using Chinese to fight other Chinese, just like the Ming Dynasty used barbarian against barbarian to you know, deal with the problem. The Manchus are going to use Chinese against Chinese to deal with this problem. Um, and when uh, three Chinese generals who had sworn loyalty to the Qing Dynasty revolts, the Manchu Emperor crushes it. This is called the rebel Rebellion of the Three Feudatories. And once that rebellion is crushed, all hope for the restoration of the Ming Dynasty is now lost. And the last Ming holdout in Taiwan surrenders. And that happens in 1683. He's the grandson of Koksenga, right? The Chinese pirate lord who pledged loyalty to the Ming Dynasty. He's the guy who took over Taiwan from the Dutch and who threatened the invasion of uh, the Philippines. So with that, uh, the Manchus now have obviously Manchuria, their homeland. Uh, they have the eastern parts of Mongolia um, and China proper. It's all now under Manchu control. Um, and then from 1683 onwards, uh, they will then go out and conquer the rest of the Mongols lands. They will incorporate Tibet as part of the Qing dynasty. And they will also incorporate Central Asia, the Eastern parts of Central Asia today, uh, land of the Uyghurs. This will all be part of the Qing dynasty so that Qing China is this vast empire that emerges. It's the largest Chinese empire ever. Um, like if you consider the Mongols Chinese, and the Mongols never consider themselves Chinese, it's kind of hard. So, you know, but this is like, you know, historically, this is the second largest empire after the Mongol Empire that's based in China. You put it that way. Uh, so, Qing China has a major problem. And that major problem is that the Manchus that came out of Manchuria, which is over here, this is Manchuria over here, are around 1% of the population. <laughs> <laughs> and over 90% of the people are Han Chinese. And you know, you got another one to 2% who are Mongols, you got another one to 2% who are Central Asians, like the Uyghurs, and you got another 1% who are the Tibetans, and you got another, you know, other various, uh, you know, non Chinese minorities in China proper in the mountains, like, you know, like the Yunnan and like that. And they number anywhere between one to 2% as well, but 90% of the people <laughs> are Han Chinese. <laughs> So how do you govern this, right? How do you rule over this and how do you govern this? And Kangxi is the key emperor. Kangxi is this guy here in the center in Manchu armor, uh, is the key emperor because he is the one who crushes the rebellion of the three feudatories. He brings all of uh, you know, China under his control, including Taiwan. And he is the one who adopts diarchy, which will be the basis of government of the Qing dynasty from that point onwards. Uh, other things that Kangxi did that's pretty important is that he created the dictionary and the encyclopedias of China. Uh, he also lowered taxes multiple times too. And that was one of the things he was very proud of. That, you know, uh, as emperor, he tried to lower the burden on the people. <laughs> uh, 
So after Kangxi, you have his son Yongzheng, which I didn't include here, but he's also pretty important. And then after Yongzheng, you have Yongzheng's son Qianlong. Qianlong was Kang, Kangxi's grandson. So these are the two emperors that you need to know. Qianlong looks like this. And under Qianlong, uh, the population of China reaches 250 million people. By the time he dies, it's now like in the 300 million range. Um, and uh, he tries to be like his grandfather, uh, does more conquests, and uh, you know, uh, uh, he also does these uh, cultural things like publication of the complete library of the four branches of knowledge, and 36,000 volumes. Uh, he also has a great art collection, which today is mostly housed in the Palace Museum in Taipei, Taiwan. It was originally in Beijing, but they moved it. Uh, so what is diarchy? This is actually pretty important. This is the key for government of the minority by uh, to rule you know, a country that's 90% Chinese. So diarchy literally means governed by two. And the two here refers to the Manchu and the Han. Right? The Han are the ethnically Chinese, right? So Kangxi recognizes that the Manchu people are the backbone of the Qing dynasty. The imperial family, he himself is Manchu after all. Uh, so who is a Manchu? Uh, Manchus are ethnically Manchu, but in the uh, Qing dynasty, they actually like make it not just an ethnic definition, you know, people who speak Manchurian and you know, you know, have Manchu dress, wear Manchu dress and live a Manchu lifestyle, but they also have it as a more uh, legal term. So uh, to organize the Manchu people, the founder of the Qing dynasty, a fellow by the name of Norhachi, created what is called the banner system. And the idea here is that Manchu society will be divided into four banners, which is later expanded to eight banners. And these eight banners will be led by a general each. And each general will have lieutenants, right? Um, and these lieutenants will each have soldiers. So, Although they're living a semi-nomadic lifestyle and people are moving from one location to another, each general must know where each of his lieutenants are and each lieutenant must know where each of his soldiers are. And so through this banner system, the Manchu emperor who knows who the generals are can now know where every single Manchu member lives, right? Every single member of the Manchu ethnicity lives. Uh, and when wartime comes, you can basically call on the general to call on the lieutenants, to call on the troops to gather a force to go fight. And the Manchu army would be fundamentally a cavalry army. Everybody would be riding horses uh, and they would be using you know, bows and arrows. They're, uh, they're uh, cavalry that fights on horseback that shoots bows and arrows primarily. Okay, so that then expands to 16 banners when uh, Kang, uh, when Nurhachi's son Hontaiji, we don't need to know the names of Nurhachi and Hontaiji, but uh, Nurhachi son Hontaiji then gets the Mongols to be the allies of the Manchus. The Eastern Mongols become allies of the Manchus. And so those Mongols are then brought into the banner system. So the eight banners become 16 banners. And when Hontaiji conquers you know, the area north of the Great Wall where there are Chinese, uh, ethnic Chinese people living there, those ethnic Chinese living there are then incorporated into Chinese banners. Uh, and these Chinese banners don't have to ride horses like the Manchu and Mongol forces, but they're expected to use guns and cannons. And so these Chinese banners, uh, the Mongol banners and the Manchu banners together form the 24 banners of the bannermen. And later what happens is uh, if you're part of the bannermen, then you're considered to be Manchu. That's what eventually happens. The Mongols eventually, you know, you know, the Mongols always maintain their identity as Mongols, so they don't really like fully buy into this. But a lot of the Chinese bannermen do buy into this, so that by the tail end of the dynasty, uh, you may have been ethnically Chinese, you know, in 1644 uh, or in 1616 when you know the Manchus began to create their state. But by you know 1910, uh, you think of yourself as Manchu. Your, your identity is now Manchu. So. Ethnic identity is, is like really fluid. Uh, and it's not something that's like, you know, cast in stone. It's one of those things that like, this is very instructive of. And these Manchus are supposed to be the loyal officers, the loyal troops of the emperor. So they are the core, they are the backbone of the dynasty. And so, you know, he tries to make sure that these Manchus don't lose their identity and don't drown in the sea of Chinese, of 90% Chinese people in this society. So as a sign of submission, uh, everybody in China must wear a Manchu hairstyle. 
<laughs> so the saying went, you know, uh, keep the hair and lose the head. Lose the hair and keep the head. <laughs> so everybody had to shave the top of their heads. And, you know, the back of the head, you could actually leave as a pigtail. And that was called the Manchu Q. Right? So everybody has, all men have to wear the Manchu hairstyle. Um, the Manchu uh, bannermen are encouraged to speak the Manchu language and write in the Manchu language as well. Um, and uh, the horseback riding skills are also encouraged to be maintained. Um, and because the Manchus led a semi-nomadic lifestyle, that meant not just men, but also women. So if women, women are going to ride horses, then Manchu women cannot bind their feet, just like Chinese women did back then. Um, I'm not going to show you foot binding. It's a bit gross, so you can look it up if you're curious. Um, and another thing to like ensure this was to make sure that Manchuria remains a home for Manchus only. And Kangxi is the emperor who bans Chinese further Chinese immigration into Manchuria. And so Manchuria is left alone as this relatively sparsely populated area. Uh, in fact, it becomes extremely uh, uh, sparsely populated because a lot of the Manchus actually leave Manchuria and they live in China proper, either near the capital, Beijing, as the bodyguards of the emperor, or in the various parts of China through the garrisons that they create, which I can talk about a bit. Uh, so the Manchus are the pillars, but then 90% Han Chinese, what do you do with these guys? The solution is to keep using the civil service exams. The Han Chinese will continue to be higher through the civil service exams. So the imperial family may be Buddhist, but they're gonna adopt Confucianism and you know, the civil service exams will continue to be held and people who pass it will continue to be hired as government officials. And at the very top level of these government officials, like this bit down here, uh, the high offices will, split, will be split evenly between Manchus and Chinese. So if you have a governor who is Chinese, then the governor general will be Manchu. And if you have a governor general that is Chinese, then the governors underneath would be Manchu. So, uh, two province, a province is ruled by a governor. Two provinces are usually, or three provinces are ruled by a governor general. Um, and if the minister of war is Manchu, then the vice minister of war will be Chinese. And if the minister of finance or minister of taxes is Chinese, then the vice minister will be Manchu. So top government posts will be split evenly between Chinese and Manchu. So Chinese will be guaranteed. Uh, how do you select the Manchu officials? You select the Manchu officials by having a civil service exam for the Manchus as well. And the civil service exam for Manchus will be held in the Manchu language, will be written in the Manchu language. Um, so Chinese can't take it. Um, this effectively means, by the way, that you know, you got you know 90% of the people who's ambitious, so ambitious people from among the 90% of the population who takes the civil service exams, and ambitious people from only 1% of the population that takes the civil service exams competing for the same spot. <laughs> so 150 Chinese from you know 90 million people. 150 Manchus from 1 million people. It's a lot easier to become government officials as a Manchu, uh, as a civilian government official. Although a lot of Manchus actually don't take that position. A lot of, a lot of the Manchus up until, you know, Kangxi and uh, his son Yongzheng's time, less so under Qianlong's time, uh, want to become government officials through the army. And uh, that's where they see their course of advancement from. They, they want to, you know, be, uh, be soldiers or officers. That, that's the key thing. Anyway, because, you know, Manchus and Chinese are working together at top government posts, what that means is there's got to be a language that they both speak. And here, the Manchus basically are the ones who become bilingual. The Manchus begin to speak Chinese. Um, and that is the language of the officials. That's what the word Mandarin means, language of the officials. So Mandarin Chinese is actually the language that the Manchus, it's like, if it's got Manchu influence in the sense that a non-Chinese people is speaking Chinese, that, that's Mandarin. <laughs> um, and today, you know, Mandarin is seen as the standard form of Chinese, but initially it wasn't the case. It was, it was just considered government Chinese, right? uh, the Chinese that the government officials spoke. But because the Manchu dynasty lasts from 1644 all the way until 1911, you know, this becomes standard Chinese today. Uh, so there you go. Um, mm, did I miss anything? Oh, yes. Um, so if you have a full melding between Chinese and Manchu, then the Manchus will disappear, as I said. So although the male hairstyle is enforced upon everybody, women's uh, fashion is not, right? So Chinese women typically practiced 
foot binding, but Manchu women were forbidden to practice foot binding. Um, and although dress, male dress typically tended to be copied, uh, but uh, female dress was a different issue. Uh, Manchu women wore traditional Manchu dress, which was essentially like you know the Chinese uh, uh, China dress, where you know it's got these long sits on the side. Manchu women wore trousers underneath this, you know, because they're riding horses, right? That's why there's slits on the side because women are riding horses. Uh, this is called the qi pao. This was forbidden to Chinese women. Ordinary Chinese women would not, were not allowed to wear that, right? Only Manchu women were allowed to wear that. So the Manchus eventually become associated with the aristocracy, understandably so, because you know, they are the, uh, you know, the guards of the emperor. They are, they are the, the, the bannermen, right? The core of the Manchu uh, dynasty. Um, and women wanted to wear, you know, Manchu female dress, but they were forbidden to do so. So what happens is that when the dynasty comes to an end in 1911, uh, Chinese fashion designers begin to make dress in the shape of the Manchu female dress, uh, and they ditch the trousers. And by the 1920s and 1930s, you get the China dress, which is the China dress that people know today. So that's like the origin of traditional Chinese dress, the, man, the China dress, which is like traditional. <laughs> I don't know how traditional it is, but you know, that's what it's usually seen as, right? But that's where it comes from. Um, I think today uh, uh, in Chinese weddings, it's very interesting because uh, women have to wear uh, three sets of clothes. <laughs> so one set is they wear the wedding dress in the Western style. Then they actually get into a, uh, you know, China dress uh, in the Manchu style you know, without the trousers. And then they also get the Han style dress of the Han Chinese traditional dress from the Ming dynasty onwards. So <laughs> they have three separate dresses that women have to wear in the Chinese wedding. Uh, it's very cool. <clears throat> All right. So that's Qianlong. Uh, sorry, that was Kangxi. So now let's talk about Qianlong and we're almost done. So Qianlong uh, was the grandson of Kangxi and he does the expansions, and he's the guy who leads China to, uh, who leads the Qing Dynasty to its maximum extent. But I want to talk about the non-Chinese peoples of the Qing Dynasty. So first and foremost, he, you know, basically carries on the tribute trade relationship that, uh, you know, or the tribute trade uh, idea of China as the center of the universe uh, is carried over by the Qing Dynasty. So uh, there is no equal to the emperor, and the splendor of Qing China is beyond anybody else. The Mongols are reduced. Uh, they initially start off as allies of the Manchus, as I said earlier, but uh, by the time you get to Qianlong, they are now vassals. They have to swear loyalty to the Manchu emperor. They're no longer equals, right? Uh, and the Mongols who refuse to swear vassalage, the Mongols who refuse to swear loyalty are totally and utterly destroyed. So the Junga Khanate, which is existed in like, you know, uh, modern parts of uh, Western China, right? And uh, Central Asia, they get totally annihilated. Um, the Jung Jungar Khanate also had a relationship with the Tibetans. And the Tibetans were led by the Dalai Lama at the time. And so Qianlong basically has to like, you know, make sure that there's a firm relationship between the Manchu emperor and the Tibetans. And the solution here, uh, and you know, the problem here is that you know, the, the Manchus are also Tibetan Buddhists. So the solution here was for the Dalai Lama, the leader of the Tibetans, to be the teacher of the emperor. But the emperor of the Manchus and of China as a whole is going to be the patron of the Dalai Lama. And so this is how Tibet is incorporated as part of the Qing Empire. Right? It's not directly governed. It is governed through the Dalai Lama's government. But the Dalai Lama himself, it take, takes a very special role as an equal to the emperor, uh, but never be able to surpass him. <laughs> Maybe the equal, but he, he's never, but the ultimate uh, political control is in the hands of the emperor. Although religious uh, affairs, the emperor cedes to the Dalai Lama. So at one point the Dalai Lama and the emperor basically meet and they meet at a dais where it's equal, where it's even to, to signify that these two people are equals. Everybody else is obviously one step below. <laughs> uh, 
the Mongols who, you know, the, uh, the Manchus conquered, uh, ruled over a non-Mongol people as well. Uh, these people included the Central Asia Muslims, mostly Uyghurs, people who are in the news today. Um, and the, you know, Qianlong's solution was to basically say, all right, we'll govern you. You just pay taxes, uh, you know, and we take care of, you know, foreign affairs and everything, but we'll leave, you can have your own self-control over your internal, you know, affairs, and we'll just leave it at that. And the, the Central Asia Muslims were very happy with that. I was like, okay, we can live with that. And they live their own lives, and the, and the Manchus basically, you know, were very hands off. Um, and Kangxi's idea that you know Chinese uh, Chinese immigration to these uh, non uh, to Manchuria being banned basically is carried over to these other non Chinese places. So Chinese merchants, uh, Chinese immigration, sorry, Chinese immigration to Mongolia, Chinese immigration to Central Asia, Chinese immigration to Outer Tibet become all banned under the Qing Dynasty. Uh, there will continue to be trade relationships that were supervised by the dynasty between the merchants, but Chinese immigration will be banned. Uh, the three tributary states that remain to the bitter end are Korea, Ryukyu, and Vietnam. They remain tributary states. Uh, Japan's uh, shoguns under the Ashikagas were uh, for a while tributary states, but once the Ashikagas are gone uh, and Hideyoshi launches that invasion, that's it. There's no formal relations between China and Japan. And even under the Qing dynasty, all the way until the 1870s, there's no formal relations between China and Japan. But Chinese merchants, do leave right uh, from uh, Ningpo and come to Japan to trade. Uh, and other foreigners are free to come to Canton uh, to trade uh, with the uh, Chinese Hong merchants, the Chinese uh, Foreign Trade Guild. Uh, and they, they, they're free to come to Canton. But this is all done under the dispensation of the emperor. So to give you further sense of this, you know, uh, relationship China has with the outside world, let's now talk specifically about Christianity, right? be specific here. So in the case of Christianity, uh, we want to talk specifically about the Jesuits. So the Jesuit order is founded by St. Ignatius Loyola and uh, six other people. One of the co-founders is St. Francis Xavier. And Francis Xavier brought Christianity to Japan, but he really wanted to bring Christianity to China, Catholicism to China. And the problem is he came to you know, China after the Portuguese had done their shenanigans. So the Portuguese were forbidden to land in Canton by the Ming Dynasty for a long time. And so the Jesuits who were with the Portuguese couldn't come to China. And so St. Francis Xavier couldn't actually step foot inside China. He made it to India and Japan, but never made it to China. Uh, the first really important uh, Jesuit missionary in China is Matteo Ricci, uh, who lived from 1552 to 1610. Right? Uh, Matteo Ricci was the guy who starts Synology. So what he does is he translates Chinese texts into Western languages and he translates uh, Western texts into classical Chinese. So he's like the bridge between China and the West. Uh, and because he was such a great scholar, uh, the emperor of the Ming dynasty invited him to Beijing, although he never met the emperor directly. Um, and various Jesuits, including Matteo Ricci, basically gained jobs as advisors to the Chinese emperors. So I think this shows you that China was never really close to the outside world per se, right? Uh, the jobs that the Jesuits got would be like, you know, in like astronomy and calendar making, sometimes painting and all these things. Now, the Jesuits, when they came to China, saw Confucianism and they saw what many people call an ancestor worship. Um, and they initially said, you know what, this is weird, but now that we fully up understand it, this doesn't clash with Christian teaching. So we're gonna let it go because it, we're going to let it be. It's fine. You can be both a Chinese Christian or Chinese Catholic and still accept Confucianism and still do your so-called ancestor worship. They are social rituals, right? So he comes at the tail end of the Ming Dynasty. Uh, and with the Ming-Qin transition, uh, you know, the Ming Dynasty is replaced with the Qing Dynasty. And initially, the Qing Dynasty is okay with the Jesuit missionaries as well. The Jesuit missionaries remain in China. Kangxi himself in his early period of, in his early years of the reign basically says Christianity is okay. Um, you know, his point is that you know the imperial family is Tibetan Buddhist, but the government is basically Confucian and the dynasty tolerates, you know, Taoism and you know Islam too. So Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Islam. You can add Christianity to that, not a big problem. All right. 
But then <laughs> among the Catholic priests themselves, there's this thing called the rights controversy. So although the Jesuits were okay with Confucianism and ancestor worship, uh, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, and the Augustinians, <laughs> these guys were not. And so the Catholic Church has a huge uh, fight over this issue. Uh, and ultimately, the Pope and the Catholic Church as a whole sides with the Dominicans and the Franciscans and the Augustinians, and they rule against the Jesuits. Uh, the Confucian rites and ancestor worship are not social rituals, but are religious rites, and therefore Chinese Catholics should not participate. Um, with that, <laughs> right, and, and you know, this controversy, you know, spills out in China itself. And with that, you know, Kangxi is like, oh, uh, so you guys are going to persecute uh, Confucianism. Our dynasty technically thinks Confucianism is the state ideology. So all Chinese missionaries, sorry, all missionaries, all Catholic missionaries must leave. <laughs> and in 1721, Kangxi basically, you know, essentially revokes the Edict of Toleration and says, get out. And for Yongzheng, Kangxi's son, uh, starts to persecute Catholicism as well, right? Not only does he say missionaries must leave, he basically starts closing down churches so that Christianity doesn't spread in China anymore. Um, and he expels all foreign priests, like, get out, right? Not just missionaries, but all priests, get out. But, you know, I mean, the persecution is mild, right? There's no execution of uh, believers or anything like that. But the point here, <laughs> I mean, I, I suppose, all right, so there's a number of points here, but you know, I suppose one of the things that people might be curious is what do we mean by like you know, ancestor worship and Confucianism? One of the things that Confucianism did uh, is that uh, they would honor the birthday of Confucius or, or uh, they would honor Confucius on certain ceremonial, on certain important days. Um, and this was perceived to be worshiping Confucius as a divine figure by the Dominicans and the Franciscans and the Augustinians. By 1939, people now fully under appreciate this and they, <laughs> they go back to Matteo Ricci's idea and says, ah, Confucius is more of a philosopher. What they're doing is they're just honoring the memory of Confucius. So this ain't religious worship, so it's okay. You can be a Catholic and still believe in Confucianism. That's not a problem. <laughs> so it turns out that you know, Matteo Ricci's uh, bid on Confucianism is affirmed there. And then the second bit is ancestor worship. A lot of people call it ancestor worship because the Chinese basically, you know, give offerings to their dead ancestors. But, uh, you know, the judges are right on this one as well. When you actually like look into it, what they're doing is you're not worshiping your dead ancestors. You're not praying to your dead ancestors to actually like, you know, do magical things for you. What you're doing is you're remembering, honoring and reminiscing the dead. <laughs> That's what you're doing, right? You're hoping good things happen to, your, to the spirits of your dead ancestors. And when you understand it this way, it's not ancestor worship. So again, this is a social ritual and it becomes okay. And in 1939, essentially the rights controversy is reversed in the favor of the Jesuits, <laughs> but it came way too late, right? By, by this point in time, you know, I mean, Christianity has gotten such a bad rap in China that uh, it doesn't get uh, that many converts. Uh, although I have heard that after uh, that you know, in the current situation in the 21st century, uh, uh, converts are beginning to happen once again. So we'll see what happens in the future. I uh, can't really trust the statistics that come out of uh, communist China, so hard to say. <laughs> All right, so now let me just finish this. Uh, the decline of the Hai Qing. So uh, what happens here is that there is corruption at Qianlong's court. Uh, emperor Qianlong was an energetic and good emperor, uh, but his reign lasts for 60 some odd years. It's too long. And he begins to start, he begins to you know, lose interest in politics halfway through. And so he begins to basically, you know, hand over power to his favorite uh, uh, Manchu uh, official by the name of Hessian. And Hessian is just a terrible person who just does, you know, just utterly and totally corrupt. Um, this is then uh, compounded by the general neglect of the bannermen, right? So the bannermen uh, in China proper can either live in Beijing, who these guys generally fare well, um, and there's land that's surrounding Beijing that's actually like, you know, earmarked as income for the bannermen. So the bannermen don't have to work for a living. Uh, all they have to do is train for war and they act as you know, bodyguards of the emperor. Um, or the bannermen live in the garrisons. The garrisons are in strategic locations throughout China. 
And just like the bannermen in Beijing, they also have lands earmarked for bannermen in the garrisons so that they also don't have to work for a living and they can just train for war and be prepared. The problem is that as these bannermen are neglected, you know, in the second half of Qianlong's reign, the generals of the garrisons uh, become corrupt because they realize that if they give gifts to Hessian, they can advance in the social, you know, within the court uh, rank and all these things. So uh, the generals then begin to treat the land that it's in their trust, that's supposed to be earmarked for the bannermen as a whole, as their own personal private property, and some of them even sell it. <laughs> so when, once this happens, instead of the profits or the, the wealth of the land flowing to the bannermen to make sure that the bannermen can survive, the wealth is diverted into the hands of the general who then use it for corrupt purposes so that he can advance in the social ladder. And the bannermen can't make a living out of that. So although it is during Qianlong in the first half of his reign that you know, China expands to the maximum extent, in the second half, the bannermen, the core of the Qing dynasty begin to decline in both quality and also quantity because once people realize that they can't make a life as a bannermen, they quit. It's like, why would you stay in a garrison if you know you're going to starve? It makes no sense, right? So they just quit. And I go back to Manchuria where they, uh, they become Chinese, right? They just live among the ordinary Chinese people. I say, I'm no longer going to be a bannerman. <laughs> uh, so that's a problem. Um, and when that happens, uh, that leads to the next problem, which is, you know, uh, in the Ming Dynasty, the reason why things started to go bad is because the gentry became slowly ignorant of the conditions of the people. Well, in the Qing dynasty, the bannermen were used as spies by emperors from Kangxi and you know, even before actually, but Kangxi and Yongzheng really relied on the bannermen to spy on the Chinese gentry, on the government officials. So there's one story of Yongzheng's reign where, you know, uh, a Chinese uh, governor is, uh, uh, you know, is, is going to his uh, uh, province. And when he gets there, he you know, basically starts to hire staff. Um, and one of the staffs that he hires, uh, and, you know, and he you know, spends his term there. And then as he's about to go back home to Beijing, you know, because his term as governor is over, he, you know, he greets all his staff and says, thank you for your service. And he fires them one, one by one. And one of them says, you have done a very good job as uh, governor. Uh, I am sure that the emperor himself would know about this. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, how would my staff member know what the emperor knows? And then, you know, after he goes back to the capital, his term is over, he's fired everybody. He meets the emperor and the emperor, you know, Yongzhen says to this Chinese uh, governor, like, you did a good job. I hear that you did this. And, he, and actually tells him all the details of what happened in his province and during his term in that province. And the, and the governor is like amazed. And then, you know, as he's leaving, he looks around and he sees a familiar face. He goes, my staff member. <laughs> and it turns out that staff member was a bannerman who had disguised himself as a staff member working for this governor, right? Because this bannerman was, you know, in bannerman armor as a guard to the emperor somewhere in the palace. And he sees the face. He goes, oh my God. And suddenly it clicks on him. So these bannermen were used as spies to make sure to keep an eye on these government officials to make sure that they don't do like crazy things um, and to fire people who, who are, because the emperor can do that. But uh, once the bannermen, uh, once the condition of the bannermen decline and once they become more and more corrupt, this ability basically goes away, right? Um, and so without checks on the gentry and on government officials in general, you know, the same problem that happened in the Ming Dynasty happens. People revolt. <laughs> Government's not responding. Like, what are you doing? Um, and the first big rebellion that you see happens at the very tail end of Qianlong's reign called the White Lotus Rebellion from 1796 to 1804. So there you go, right? Uh, that's what happens in the decline of the High Qing. Right? Uh, 30 years of government neglect is a long time. Uh, 30 years is enough for you know, an entire generation to basically turn over. So that, that really can change things. Um, all right. So let's just finish the summary. Uh, China, you know, is fundamentally autonomous. If by China you include the Manchus, uh, the Qing emperors themselves saw China and the Qing dynasty as synonymous. So uh, 
China is doing its own thing. Now, um, if you mean China by including the Manchus, then that sentence is accurate. But if you mean China by speaking from the perspective of the Han Chinese, then I think ultimately you have to say that the Han Chinese were at the mercy of the Manchus. <laughs> the Manchus really were in charge. They really knew how to govern. Right? Um, and uh, the Western impact was not that big on China, whether it's China that includes the Manchus or China that doesn't include the Manchus. The Western political impact was not huge, but the expansion of trade to global trade, that had a huge impact on China. Uh, so the population uh, grows from 60 million to anywhere between 100, 150 million around 1644, 1683, and over 300 million by around 1800. And the adoption of silver as a currency in the full commercialization society, that happens towards the tail end of the Ming Dynasty. Uh, you have the creation of what's considered to be traditional Chinese culture, of the spread of Chinatowns in Southeast Asia. So just like with the Middle East, just like with India, you know, trade links the globe, it has its impact, but in terms of politics, you know, these places are still pretty much doing their own thing. It's not all fully connected. And that's it with China. So it's a pretty long uh, lecture, but I'll see you guys in the next one.